So we consider whether this otherwise clause should be read in light of the limited reach of the specific provision that precedes it. Okay, so otherwise, what the heck does that mean? This subprovision two is way more powerful than one. So if this is way more powerful than one, why do you even need it? You don't because it's not more powerful, obviously. A huge swath of these charges should be dismissed. That just narrowed it bigly. They have to check all of these additional boxes. They found this statute. They charged it because it was broad, because they couldn't find anything else to charge. The Supreme Court of the United States released a major opinion that has major impacts on the J6 cases, saying that the charge that was brought by Biden's DOJ is illegitimate, not lawful as applied to this case. We're talking about this statute, 1512C1 of the U.S. Code, and we had an interesting split today in this decision. So it was a six to three decision, but we had one liberal join with the conservatives, and we had one conservative, Amy Coney Barrett, join with the liberals. And the defense attorney, Jackson, joined with the majority to find that this charge is not valid as it is applied in this case. And so, relatively quickly, I do believe, an author of this opinion from the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Roberts, delivers the opinion of the court. You may have heard of this, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that came out of 2002. It created a new law, made it illegal, created criminal liability for the following. This is some heavy statute language, so let's just break it down. You are guilty of a crime if you are someone who corruptly, see that word with the L-Y, if you alter, destroy, mutilate, conceal a record, document, or other object, or you attempt to do so with the intent to impair the object's integrity or availability for use in an official proceeding, okay? So we're taking a record, a document, or something. We have a corrupt purpose behind it. Our intent is to corrupt the documents to impair its integrity for an official proceeding. So it's kind of like you're fraudulently altering a document. Now in that charge, there's another subset section. So we go down below that. So 15C1 says that. The next subsection, 1512C2, and they charge the J6ers under this, and we'll explain how insane that is in a minute. But in the next subsection, they say that it extends that prohibition. So that's illegal, but it's also illegal to anyone who otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so. So we consider whether this otherwise clause should be read in light of the limited reach of the specific provision that precedes it. Okay. So otherwise, what the heck does that mean? So it's corruptly altering, mutilating a document or other object or in attempts to do so for these other limited things, right? In order to be guilty under C1, you got to hit those elements. Those are different checkboxes there. You have to be acting corruptly. You have to do one of these following things, alter, destroy, mutilate, conceal. It has to be done onto a document or something else, another object. And you have to have intent to impair, like when you alter it, why did you alter it? You had the intent to literally impact the integrity of that. And that document needs to be used in an official proceeding. So like that's a separate issue. Like what is an official proceeding? How do you check the box off for integrity? So all of this is very narrow. And what is an official proceeding? What is the document? And is the document used in the proceeding? And very detailed. But then this subsection C2 just broadens it. Okay. Or otherwise obstructs or influences or impedes any official proceeding. Again, whatever that means or any other attempts to do so. So can you read 15 C2 in isolation alone and apart from the others? Court is asking that question. They say, let's get some background on the case. So now we know what the issue is. Can you just bring this charge or does this charge need to be limited and narrowed by the preceding charge? So here's some background. This is a J6 case. This case involves concerns that the prosecution of this guy called Joseph Fisher, it's about him, for his conduct on J6. Now that day, both houses of Congress convened in a joint session to certify the votes. While they did that, a crowd of supporters was outside. As set forth in the criminal complaint, the crowd eventually forced entry into the building. That's the government's terms. They broke windows. They assaulted members of the Capitol. Capitol Police. This breach caused members of Congress to evacuate and delay the certification. The complaint alleges that Fisher was one of those who invaded the building. Or invaded is kind of a strong word. Of course, we know that they were also tapping people on the shoulders and telling cops to stand out of the way so that people could just walk on in, almost like inviting them in. So I don't know if that's really an invasion if you're invited, kind of. But according to the complaint, about an hour after the House's recess, okay, the Houses were not in an official proceeding anymore because they had recess, Fisher trespassed into the Capitol and was involved in a physical confrontation. So there was no official proceeding because it was over. Fisher claimed in Facebook posts that he pushed the police back about 25 feet and he was inside the Capitol talking to the police. Body camera footage shows he was near a scrum of the crowd as the officers were trying to eject people from the building. Now a grand jury came back, indicted him. Seven counts. Six of those counts include assault on a federal officer, entering, remaining, disorderly conduct, and the other things. Those six counts have their own penalties. But in count three, the one that we're talking about right now, the 
only count here before this court, the government charged Fisher with violating 18 U.S. Code 15 C2, that separate provision that says otherwise, right? In my opinion, it's a subcomponent of the first one. So all of those check boxes from C1 need to be checked before you can go to C2. Now, Fisher moved to dismiss that count, arguing the provision criminalizes only attempts to impair the availability or the integrity of evidence. And the district court granted his motion in relevant part. It said that the scope of 15 C2 is limited by C1. And so you have to have taken some action with respect to an actual document, okay? Not just impeding a proceeding. You actually have to hit a document, which is described in C1, as we just read. Now, a divided panel of the DC circuit, because it's the DC circuit, so they just do anything that is harmful to the J6ers, they reversed and they remanded the case for further proceedings. So they said, no, you can charge that. No problem, DOJ. Judge Pan, writing for the court, held that the words otherwise means that the provision covers all forms, okay, whatever you want, of a corrupt obstruction of official proceeding. It's super broad. And in addition to conduct that's already covered by C1. So it's actually expansive. They were very narrow in C1, but then they basically said you can do whatever the hell you want in C2, is how this judge interpreted that, because she's an idiot. So why do you need C1 if you just have C2 because it's so broad? You wouldn't really need C1. But anyways, Judge Walker concurred in part and concurred in the judgment because he read the mens rea element of the statute, the corruptly, as requiring the defendant to act with an intent to procure an unlawful benefit. Now, there was a dissent. In the dissenter's view, the language in C1 narrows the language that comes after the word otherwise. He therefore construed that as applying only to acts like the ones in C1. And so the Supreme Court granted this case. And they tell us, all right, this controversy is about C2. On the one hand, the defense Fisher says that C2 applies only to acts that affect the integrity and the availability of evidence. On the other hand, the government says, no, 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 it captures all the forms of conduct, even beyond section C1. So we have two different hula hoops, okay? The defense says it's very narrow like this, and the government says it's very broad like this. It covers everything, and the defendant who's right here in the middle is not covered, or has a much narrower coverage of criminality. It's gotta be very narrow. So resolving such a dispute require us to determine how a residual clause is linked to the surrounding words. And so they're gonna do some heavy analysis. Okay, here's the statute. Here's how you break it down. C1, and then we have read that previously. C2 says right here, or otherwise obstructs. So they say, okay, C1 describes a particular type of conduct, which we read. And C2 says it's also illegal to engage in some other broader range of unenumerated conduct. Now the purpose of otherwise, as the parties agree, is to cover some set of matters that are not specifically contemplated. So it's right, it is broad. But the problem is what is left for C2? What else can you read into that? Perhaps Congress sought to criminalize all obstructive acts, like everything in there? And so they devised C2 to prohibit the rest in one go. Like they just gave us some examples, like this is bad, but also you have the ability to go after things that are clearly bad, but also you can have the ability to go after anything also that you might think is bad, that is whatever, because it's not really defined. So if you have that second, why do you need the first? Doesn't really make that much sense. Now the point of C1, if you believe in that model, would be to illustrate just one type of conduct among many that C2 prohibits, it would also be subsidiary to the overarching prohibition in C2, right? So in other words, this subprovision two is way more powerful than one. So if this is way more powerful than one, why do you even need it? You don't, because it's not more powerful, obviously. Now, but they write, Supreme Court. But C2 could also have a narrower scope as well. Subsection C1 would then prohibit particular types of obstructive conduct, and then C2 would fill inadvertent gaps in that type of conduct. So one way to discern what the word otherwise means is to just go back and look at some other case law. For example, let's give an example about a zoo. Here's an example. A zoo might post a sign that reads, do not pet, feed, yell, or throw objects at the animals or otherwise disturb them. If a visitor eats lunch in front of a hungry gorilla or talks to a friend near its enclosure, has he obeyed the regulation? Surely yes. Okay, it says don't pet, don't feed, don't yell, don't throw. But if you're eating food there and there's a hungry gorilla, that could be a problem, right? Although the smell of human food or the sound of voices might disturb gorillas, the specific examples of impermissible conduct all involve direct interaction with the zoo animal. Merely eating or talking is so unlike the other examples, the zoo provided that it would be implausible to assume those activities were prohibited, even if literally covered by the language. Now, the idea is simply that a general phrase can be given a more focused meaning by the terms linked to it. Principle is all over the place. For instance, a football league might adopt a rule that says players cannot grab, twist, or pull a face mask, a helmet, or otherwise, or other equipment with the intent to injure a player or otherwise attack, assault, or harmony player. Now, if a linebacker shouts insults at the quarterback and hurts his feelings, has the linebacker, 
nonetheless followed the rule? Of course he has. The examples of prohibited actions all concern dangerous physical conduct. Trash talk is not the kind. Now, similarly, there are improbable consequences from untethering an otherwise provision from the rest of the statute, right? If you decouple these things, you can have a really big problem. In this other case, we had that and we had to rectify that. The list of crimes was burglary, arson, extortion, and other things. And we had to connect it back to that in order to make sense of it. Now, if as the government asserts here, if C2 covers all forms of conduct, even beyond C1, there would have been scant reason for Congress to give any examples at all. Exactly. You don't need it. If C2 is more powerful than C1, just get rid of C1. It would be an elaborate pump fake, okay? It lists four types of conduct, but it doesn't matter because everything that's a violation of C1 would obviously automatically be a violation of C2. Now, tethering C2 recognizes the distinct purpose of each provision. As we've already explained, C1 defines crimes. When that phrase otherwise is narrower, you can see there are possibilities where it could be used in other ways. For example, it's possible to violate C2 by creating false evidence rather than altering incriminating evidence, right? Could you create it, but you didn't alter it? C1 talks about altering. What if you created it? Okay, maybe that applies. It also ensures that there's liabilities for things impairing the availability of integrity of other things used in official proceedings. And so the dissent says otherwise can mean also in a different manner or by other means or in other respects, but that is not sufficient enough to make that link. And it makes sense also in this context. Why do we have Sarbanes-Oxley? Prior to that, section 1512 imposed criminal liability on anyone who knowingly uses intimidation or whatever to shred documents. But the Enron scandal, which is why we got Sarbanes-Oxley, revealed a loophole. Although Enron's outside auditor had systematically destroyed the incriminating documents, kind of like what we do now, when we just outsource our elections to third parties and stuff, the statute curiously failed to impose liability on a person who destroys records himself. So as a result, prosecutors had to prove that higher-ups at Enron and Arthur Anderson persuaded someone else to shred the documents, rather than the more obvious theory that the one who shreds the documents is liable for it. Okay, so you can't destroy the property of another, but if you destroy your own, you're good. So they just destroyed their own. The parties agreed that to plug this loophole, Congress had to enact this. This was an Enron gap. It was about destroying documents in billion dollar organizations, not about J6ers going into the Capitol building. The better conclusion is that C2 was designed by Congress to apply to those contexts. But the government's response is that this surplusage problem are not convincing. Their responses to this problem are not convincing. So they're saying, look, if we read it your way, government, then all of this other stuff becomes irrelevant. We have surplus statutes and language because everything can just fit into here. We have obstruction. We have all of these other rules. 1512D1, 1512A3, 1512A2B5, B4. We got B3. We got all of these other things that makes these other items criminal. So if we have C2 that makes everything criminal, no matter what, then what were those other provisions for? We have to give effect to those other provisions and we can't do that. The government made their arguments. They contend that the interpretation doesn't create surplusage because it's more broadly than an official proceeding. And their arguments continue. Now, the dissent also tries to solve this, that some of our reading also creates surplusage. And so you're creating surplusage as well. And the idea is that our government is just basically incompetent. Our legislators can't create good statutes because they're incompetent. Now, they're talking about obstruction cases and they continue on. They wrap it up. They say, for all these reasons, this is the majority, subsection C2's surrounding words suggest that we should not give this otherwise provision the broadest possible meaning. Now, although the government's all-encompassing interpretation may be literally permissible, it defies the most plausible understanding of why C1 and C2 are conjoined. It renders an unnerving amount of statutory language mere surplusage if they're disconnected. Given that subsection C2 was enacted to address the Enron disaster, not some further flung set of disasters, it's unlikely that Congress responded with such an unfocused and grossly incommensurate patch. We therefore decline to adopt the government's interpretation, which is inconsistent with how the law is written in the context in which the statute arose. Here's the final word on this. To prove a violation of section 1512C2, the government must establish that the defendant, so this is going to apply to Fisher here, but to everybody who's been charged with 1512C2, the government must prove. So they just got a bunch of new checkboxes. It went from a very broad universe of potential criminality to very narrow. It says the integrity, they have to prove the following, that the defendant impaired the availability or integrity for use in an official proceeding of records, documents, objects, or as we earlier explained, other things used in the proceeding or attempted to do so. All right, so a huge swath of these charges should be dismissed. That just narrowed it bigly. They have to check all of these 
these additional boxes. They found this statute, they charged it because it was broad, because they couldn't find anything else to charge. And now the court has narrowed that, and rightly so. The judgment of the corrupt DC Circuit Court is therefore vacated. The case is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. And on remand, the DC Circuit may assess the sufficiency of count three of this indictment in light of our interpretation. So they're sending this back down to the trial court. They can hold a hearing to see that charge should ultimately be dismissed, whether they can check those boxes off. And my guess is that they will not be able to do that. The statute was written for Enron. It was written for documents. It was not written for people going into the building after they were tapped on the shoulder and allowed to pass on in. So an amazing decision from the United States Supreme Court. That is a big win. Section 1512C2, now basically dead as a J6 charge. Sarbanes-Oxley was written for Enron and for bureaucratic corruption, financial fraud. There was nothing like that that happened here on J6. And so we know our government doesn't care. They were just trolling through the statutes to try to find something that would allow them to say a bunch of J6ers corruptly interfered with this or whatever and charge them with major crimes because they had to create a political narrative. But fortunately, the Supreme Court came out and corrected the record on that. And this wasn't a party line split. Amy Coney Barrett joined with the left on this and Judge Jackson, former criminal defense attorney, joined with the right on this. So for all the people always hemming and hawing about how the Supreme Court is so biased and partisan, that's not what happened here. And it's a good outcome. It's the right outcome. Our corrupt government shouldn't be searching for statutes to try to make up crimes against alleged criminal defendants who didn't even violate the laws in most circumstances. So that is what SCOTUS held out for us. We've got more opinions coming. We were waiting for the immunity decision to come next week. So we'll be here continuing to cover it, my friends. So thank you for subscribing. Thank you for joining us as our coverage here continues. Would absolutely love it if you invited a friend or family member to come over to our channel to check it out so they could see what's happening in these court cases. They can stay apprised of all this election litigation. There will be more of it to come, no doubt about it, especially after that debate performance. And we'll look forward to seeing you back here on the next one.